An overly busy, hurried life is the new normal in the Western world, and it's toxic. The problem isn't when you have a lot to do, it's when you have too much to do, and the only way to keep up is to hurry. What is all this distraction and pace doing to our souls? I want to be fully present to the moment, to God, to other people, and to my own soul. Do you? As you may know, we are in this series called Unhurry, where we are looking at a rhythm and a pace of life that is God-honoring. Uh, in week one, we focused on silence and solitude. Last week, I preached about slowing down, slowing down to catch up with God. I gave some practical tips, some slowing techniques that you could put into place to start slowing your life down. And I want you to know, they're really, really hard. And I tried one just a few hours after service ended last weekend. My family was at an event with a couple hundred people. A few of Redeemer people were there, and they said jokingly, are you going to be the last one to leave so you can practice slowing down your life? And I said, yep. Here's me at an event, and no one's there. The chairs are already stacked in the background. I stayed until everyone left. It about killed me. I just wanted to go, but God kept saying, no, 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 slow. And that's the series we're in. Uh, when we put this series on paper and started planning it, God put it on my heart to invite Ryan Myers to preach on the topic of the Sabbath. Ryan really does not need much of an introduction around here because he's been around here forever. Literally this morning I asked him, how many years have you been here? And I calculated that uh, against how old this church is. Ryan has been a part of Redeemer, 74% of the life of this church. So he's been here a long time. You've probably heard him teach in Sunday school. So grateful for you. I honor you. I love you. And I'm so thankful for the chance to learn from you today. Uh, would you give one of our own a very warm welcome, Ryan Myers. Why don't... We just take a deep breath. Take a slow, deep breath. It may be the only one you take all day. I believe years ago, through the power of the Holy Spirit, a German Jesuit priest named Karl Rahner made this statement. Knowing God is more important than knowing about God. Knowing God is more important than knowing about God. I would like to uh, go from there and, and offer up a prayer from this wonderful book called Every Moment Holy, and then we're going to dive in together, my friends. So join me uh, in an attitude of prayer. Meet us, O Christ, in this stillness of morning. Move us, O Spirit, to quiet our hearts. Mend us, O oh Father, from yesterday's harms. From the discords of yesterday, resurrect our peace. From the discouragements of yesterday, resurrect our hope. From the weariness of yesterday, resurrect our strength. From the doubts of yesterday, resurrect our faith. From the wounds of yesterday, resurrect our love. Let us enter this new day aware of our need and awake to your grace, O oh Lord. Amen. Well, my friends, this is funny. This is funny that I'm doing this. I am 43 years old, and I met Jesus Christ as a 17-year-old on a ski trip that Denise McKinney, the director of student ministry, led uh, that my best buddy at the time, Scott Seacrest, happened to, to be a part of the youth group. And we went, we skied in Wolf Creek. It was the first time for me to spend time in the Rockies. 
my first time to really experience the joy that is snow skiing, and most importantly, it was the first time I ever really uh, encountered the, the living Jesus. And so I need you to know that I am not a Bible scholar. Adam Barnett, Dave Brownlee, and the, the people that usually are up here, they are much more qualified than me. So if this is your first Sunday, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I ask of you, beyond continuing to breathe, if you could do me a solid and, and give me your attention, not because I am worthy of it, but I pray that God would use my words to draw you closer to himself. Uh, my only qualification, I guess, is, is that I uh, love Jesus and I love this church. This is not just a place I come to on Sundays. This is a place that I've lived, a group of people that I've lived the majority of my life with. And so I, I, I am delighted and honored that Adam gave me the opportunity to share about a topic I think is really important. A topic that I am struggling to practice myself, but, but really beyond the great classroom of being married to my wife, Allison, and, and father to my three kids, Parker, Reese, and Merrick, I get the privilege of living the peculiar life of, of really uh, having served as a counselor in three very different settings, but it's the same job in three different environments. I'm currently the director of student, uh, excuse me, the director of counseling, I'll get to that in a sec, in wellness at Holland Hall, a school here in Tulsa. Prior to that, I was on staff here at the church. Prior to that, I was a uh, licensed therapist at Laureate Psychiatric Clinic and Hospital. But really, I've done the same thing at all three of those places. I get the privilege of being invited into people's lives, and not because I've got the answers or that I'm a model citizen, but I believe God made me to join up with people and to help them take a step towards what it means to live a more full and whole life. And so I want to draw you back in time. About 20 years ago, uh, I was nearing the end of graduate school, and uh, a buddy of mine, Jeff Porter, and I, we, uh, we hit up another friend of ours, Nader Wadia, who I met through Redeemer. And uh, Nader came to the States from Cairo, Egypt. He was a foreign exchange student with uh, another Redeemer family, Jim and Debbie Wakefield, and the Wakefields have a beautiful home, and they have a great hot tub that is behind their home, and there's a beautiful wooded area, and it was Christmas break uh, that year, and Jeff and I asked Natter, hey, you want to get in the hot tub and hang out tonight? Natter had to go to the airport to pick up someone, and the Wakefields were out of town, so he says, that's fine, you just can't go in the house. So we got the hot tub rolling and we get in the hot tub. And I did like any good graduate student would do. I wanted to practice my tricks on my buddy. And so we close our eyes and I proceed to guide him through a sequence of progressive relaxation and guided imagery. This is a legitimate therapeutic intervention that is used to treat, along with other things, anxiety. And so we're going through this process and I can tell that there is a bright light kind of shining on me. And I just keep trucking because I think maybe the motion sensor lights have come on. But I realize that's not what it is. I open my eyes and there is a Tulsa police officer standing on the porch of the Wakefield's home. And his first question is, do you live here? And being an honest person, I say, no, officer. This is the home of my friend Natter's American family. Which was true. It was true. His next question was, do you all have any forms of identification? I said, yes, sir, they're in my pants up there on the deck. He gets my ID and Jeff's ID, and, and by the grace of God, I had a clean record. Jeff's was clean enough, I guess. And he came back, and, and it was believable. We did not know the silent alarm had gone off when Natter left the house. Why the heck did I just tell a hot tub story in church? Um... I believe that too many of us today live life in such a way that our normal rhythm has at its core excessive stress, pressure, and, and the notion of rest and play are foreign concepts to many of us. And so for many reasons, I think we struggle to notice the light shining in our face, whether we're in the hot tub doing all the psychology stuff or not, we don't even see it. 
And God moves in those ways sometimes where it's instant, like Paul's encounter with God. But for many of us, it is slow, and it demands our attention and focus. And like my good buddy Garland Tackett says, it seems for whatever reason that God oftentimes is interested in playing the long game with us. Unfortunately, for many of us, patience, I believe, is a foreign fruit. We know what it means, but it is not necessarily something that we, we live with and carry in life. So I want to invite you, we're going to anchor into two familiar texts together. Genesis 2, 1 and 2. If you'll join me there, it's going to be on the screen, but I always think there's power in putting your own eyes on the Holy Scripture. So we've, we've gone through the first chapter where God, with his word, speaks creation into existence. And there's a rhythm. There's a rhythm by which God creates. And once creation has gone down, we read this. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. From there, I want you to flip over to Exodus 20, another familiar text. As Moses is encountered in a very overwhelming way, God, the big, the powerful, the in-your-face and as we're, we're learning about this, this, this idea of the Ten Commandments, right there kind of in the middle of the ten, it says this. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we got a problem. We've got a problem. The, the problem is not one that I want you to receive from my mouth and walk away from here feeling like a horrible person. That is not my point. But I want to call it the way I see it, the way I see it in my life. We are living life at a pace trying to juggle and bring on so much that it is not sustainable, number one. Number two... It is totally disconnected from what we read about in the Old Testament as a command from God. Not a suggestion, not a kind of throw it out there and, hey, if that's your thing, take it and run with it. No, this is a commandment that, that I was reminiscing this week. Years ago, my buddy Josh Thomas and I we were having coffee on his back porch. And Josh, I don't even remember what we were talking about, but he was like, man, if you think about it, the, the honoring and keeping of the Sabbath as a commandment, that doesn't even cross our minds. We kind of know what it means, I think. We know what it looked like in, in the Old Testament times, pre-Jesus. But it's, it's kind of like a story, and then we kind of have gone on down the road. Beyond it being a commandment, we forget, as we can read... Right there at the end of the second chapter of Mark. Thumb there if you, if you can. It's the story of Jesus and the disciples. They're walking through a grain field. And this picture is painted of these guys kind of running their hands along the tops of these heads of grain. And a couple of them pick them and eat them. And, and the, the, the legalistic Pharisees, the ones that are just chomping at the bit to tell people how wrong they are. The people that really got Jesus fired up. They call these people out. And here's, here's part of what Mark says Jesus responds to their kind of critique. Jesus declares, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a commandment, and the Sabbath is a gift. It's a gift that we miss. 
We've missed it. And we need it. Not just because God says we do. Think about our lives today. As a, as a therapist, like I said, I've been able to, to sit with people and walk with people and see how fragmented, disconnected, broken out into different pieces and spheres of life when we were made, I believe, biologically, psychologically, socially, spiritually. We were made for wholeness. And we were made to be connected to God. Somewhere along the way, we've, we've twisted off from there. We also find ourselves living in a time where noise is a part, an integral part, of our culture. It it, it resides all around us, but it is a part of our inner landscape. And it's funny, stop and think about this. Sometimes the way that we cope with the noise in our heads is that we add on more noise. I am, and please hear me out, whether you're a teenager or, or middle age or, or live in the dream in retirement, I'm not anti-technology. I am not a fan of the AirPods. Not a fan. Not a fan. It, it's, it's like a, a sly way to stroll around and you, get, you give the illusion that you're giving your attention to a person or whatever, but you're, you're, getting, you're getting your jam on or you're listening to a podcast or whatever. And, and sometimes that's because we don't think what's in front of us is worth our time. But sometimes we do this stuff, not just with AirPods, but other ways. Because we, we don't know what's going to happen if we kind of slow down and remove, remove and strip away some of that noise. We've got a noise problem. We've got a pace problem. This, this difference between fast and slow, not just speed measured by a radar gun, but it's a way of life. I read a book years ago, a great book called In Praise of Slowness by a Canadian journalist named Carl Henre. And he talks about the difference between fast and slow. Fast being busy, controlling, aggressive, hurried, overly analytical, stressed out, superficial, impatient, excessively active, and interested in quantity over quality. Slow, Henre says, is calm careful, receptive, still, intuitive, patient, reflective, and it's about quality over quantity. Another guy, this this, uh, therapist that lives in Seattle uh, named Dan Allender wrote a great book on the Sabbath. It's called Sabbath. And Allender says that as far as he can tell in his research and talking to people through his clinical experience, there are three primary obstacles to people practicing the Sabbath. The first one he says is pride. We have a pride issue. We all do, I think. We we, we think that our, our, our life is so important or that we are so needed or, I think for some of us, if we, if we stop and rest, it messes with our concept of who we are as people, what my identity is. Sadly, I've seen this play out in, in, in my clinical years of, of working with folks, where you live for the almighty retirement, and you get there, and you don't have a clue who you are. Terrifies people. And then they've got that crisis And they look back and they think, oh my goodness, I blew it. I blew it. I've been checking boxes. I've been trying to survive. And now I don't know who I am and whatever with my health. And and so I think pride gets jumbled up in there. We overestimate our importance. We do. We're the only us that God made on the planet. And he needs us. But we are not as important as we think we are. We're just not. The second thing Allender says is that we've got an issue with distraction. This is not just an ADHD problem, my friends. We are a distracted people. We seek out distraction, and it's coming at us all of the time. And I'm not just talking about bad distractions, unhealthy, sinful, Adam and I were talking this week. I I think this is fascinating. 
I think it's incredible the work that the leaders of our church pour into the programs that are offered. They, they, they do a good service to honor God for our betterment. But many of us are distracted when we come into this space in particular. And we leave with an evaluation. Eh, I didn't like the songs. Uh, the sermon wasn't relevant. Uh, that, that pastor isn't quite my favorite. I have a hard time hanging in there. Because we're distracted. That's not a them problem. That's an us problem. We bring that with us into church and in other places. The third thing that Allender mentions is that fear is a great block to the Sabbath. It is. I think that more of us than not walk around being driven by fear. Fear of various things. Fear of what's going to come up in our mind if we slow down. Fear of what's going to happen if we are physically alone for a period of time. Fear of what we're going to talk about with someone we're in a relationship with if we're not watching a movie or cracking jokes or talking about the weather or some other superficial stuff. We have a fear problem. I think some of us think that if we, if we slow down, we can't afford to because we're so desperately trying to keep up and hang. I, I really believe, think about this, this idea of keeping up with the Joneses. I have a question for you this morning. Who are your Joneses? And why on earth are you trying to keep up with them? For many of us, our Joneses are people we either do not know or we know them and we don't even like them. And we have given so much power away. It's not their fault. It's a choice. It's a choice we made. So the, the, these are some of the problems in our midst. And so, I, you know, the solution, the solution not to avoid the wrath of God, but the solution to step into a, a greater sense of peace and fullness in life, real life, is, is, is right there waiting for us in the form of the Sabbath. So I want to remind you of two things before we proceed. Definitions matter. They matter. We're intelligent people, educated. We throw out these words sometimes, and we think we know what the other person is talking about, but we may be operating with very different definitions. The Sabbath means to rest. It means to rest. What does that mean for you? I can tell you what it means for me. I don't know that that's important. What does it mean to you? In addition to that, pay attention to what you pay attention to. A psychiatrist named Kurt Thompson uh, wrote a book and he talks about this idea really drawing from a lot of Jesuit Christian wisdom that, that where our mind goes, so the rest of us goes. And just because our body is in a place does not mean that our attention is there. Whether you realize it or not, today, the 20th of February, you are practicing things. You practice things when you woke up. You will leave here in a moment and you will practice other things. What are you practicing? And really more important than that, what do you desire to practice going forward? Some of you are practicing worrying about other people, what they think about you, or worrying for them, something that, that you are, are worried is going to happen. Others of you are practicing serving people. Some of us in here, whether we like to admit it or not, we practice seeking pleasure, self-pleasure. Avoiding pain and discomfort. Some of us practice work. The work that gives us a paycheck. The work that maybe defines our life more than we'd like to admit it. What are you practicing and what do you desire to practice going forward? Dan Allender, once again, he makes the statement in his book, book that Sabbath is about practicing delight. Have you ever thought about that? Not just removing the busyness, removing the distraction, 
not working, but doing those things so as to practice delight with your whole self. Allender makes this statement. He says that the only parameter that is to guide our Sabbath is delight. Will this be merely a break or a joy? Will this lead my heart to wonder or routine? Will I be more grateful or just happy that I got something else done? Adam, I believe towards the end of his sermon last week, if you were with us, made the statement kind of referencing pace of life and, and, and using music as an analogy. Here in a little bit, we're going we're gonna to join one another in a time of stillness and just meditation, reflecting on these words or just the beautiful notes that uh, are going to be played for us. I, I think that many of us, if we're honest, the rhythm of our life today is exhausting. Or it's very chaotic. It's, 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 it's a lot, it's a lot of noise, a lot of noise, and then some more noise, and we think that what gives our life meaning is whatever action we put into it, the words we say, the stuff we do, the paradox of music, the paradox of Jesus, is that the beauty and the good is not necessarily in the notes, but the space between the notes. The, the, great, the great philosopher of our day, Trey Anastasio, the leader of the band Fish. <laughs> Trey says that beautiful music is not just notes played well, but rather notes that are paired well with space and silence. The other wise sage, no longer with us, Miles Davis once said, it's not the notes you play, but the notes that you don't play. How we use our action and how we use stillness and silence. I have lived my entire adult life in some form or fashion working with adolescents. It is a gift that God has given me to spend time with adolescents. And I've learned through them that questions, big questions, these three questions, are not just unique to their developmental stage in life, but they ripple into adulthood. You've got them probably with you this morning. What is life for? Who am I? And does my life matter? My friends, happiness is not the point. Happiness is not the point. God is not anti-happy. I love to be happy. If you know me, I love to have a good time. It's just not the end goal. Sabbath can be something that is very foreign and very daunting and overwhelming. And so my invitation beyond some questions that I've thrown your way this morning is, is to realistically look at where you're at and what is one step you can take in the direction of practicing this. If a 24-hour day in a given seven-day week is, is just not going to be an option for you right now, don't beat yourself up. Pick something. Start somewhere. One hour. Once a day, one hour, the same day every week. But do it. Not because I said so. Do it because God wants you to delight. Delight in his presence. Delight in his love. And if that is still something that is so abstract and foreign, I invite you to use one of the greatest gifts that is in your life that you maybe aren't even aware of. For me, what kept me away from the church up until the point that I was 17 years old was the same thing that drew me to this place. And it is the people. This building is a gift that we get to use. The programs that are offered, the events, it's all great. The body of Christ is the church. You are the church. Let's use one another. If you know someone that does this, ask them questions. 
If you don't know someone, seek out some books. I'd be glad to give you some recommendations. But start somewhere and use one another. There was, uh, years ago, uh, a guy named Yvonne Chouinard, the guy that founded the, the company Patagonia. He was a rock climber, surfer, a wild mountain man extraordinaire, and he and a group of buddies went in a VW bus from Southern California down to Chile, uh, surfing along the way to climb this peak that had not been summited prior to their trip. And about 10, 15 years ago, another group of outdoorsmen wanted to recreate this trip. They made a great documentary called 180 degrees south. The guy that was the primary maker of the film, Jeff Johnson, said this in the film. The best journeys answer questions that in the beginning you didn't even think to ask. This is the way of Jesus. This is the life we were made for. Not just checking boxes, not just punching the time card, doing the same thing over and over again. But, but this, is, this is what we were made for. And the Sabbath is a great resource that is really untapped. The most important decision that we make every day, my friends, and we don't even realize it, and we make it over and over again is this. What shall I give my attention to? What shall I give my attention to? Will you join me in prayer, please? Almighty God, we are grateful for you, your presence in our lives, the opportunities you provide us with. God, we thank you that you are always present. No matter what is going on, what we've done or haven't done, what we're thinking, what we're feeling, you are here and we need you. God, I pray that you would help us to linger with some of these questions. I pray that you would help us to wrestle with what Sabbath might look like in our lives. And here in just a moment, God, I pray that we could enter this time and space to be still. To, to soak up the goodness of, of your beauty through music played by these two men. And, and may we meet you there, not just in the notes but also the space in between the notes. We pray all of this in the mighty name of the Christ. Amen.